I have a, uh, a superpower that I don't use anymore um, because it hurts people's feelings. And so I'm just going to tell you about it. Um, when, when Ashley and I first got together, um, when it would come to some kind of holiday, whether a gift-giving holiday, so birthdays, uh, Christmases, things like that, um, I have this ability to, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not snooping, I'm not looking at receipts, I just have this ability to know what's in the wrapper before I open it. And so what I would do to demonstrate, and just to show my wife that I'm really, really smart in this way, I would announce what it is that I'm about to open before I open it, okay? And so I would say things like, oh, this is a, I don't, I don't remember an example, this is a mag light or something like that. And, and then I would open it up, and yeah, it was, it was exactly what I said. And I thought this was just a fun game. I thought this was so good. Uh, until about the, like the third time of me doing it, I'm like, this is a... Uh, I don't know, the pair of shoes or something, and I would open it up, and it was a pair of shoes, and I look over, and she is devastated that I'm guessing what these things are before I open them, and so there's this one moment where she has this one tear coming down her cheek. It's the sweetest thing ever. And, you know, why? Why? She says, you shouldn't guess it. You shouldn't know, and and I just felt like, well, you should be impressed with how smart your husband is, right? Um, but she, she was not impressed, uh, and I discovered that this little superpower of mine was offending my wife my new wife at the time. And so I no longer do that. I do, I do play the game in my head, but I play it quietly so that, that she, she doesn't get upset. Um, we love getting gifts, usually. Most people do. Uh, there's a few weird ones in here, like, I really wish you guys would forget about my birthday. But the rest of you, you just love getting gifts. You love, you love what it means. You love that someone thought of you. Usually it's a gift that kind of represents your, uh, your personality in some way. They're thinking about you. And so you get this gift, and then to unwrap it is to enjoy it, to, to um, kind of un unlock it. Maybe you're wearing something right now. I wonder how many dads in here are wearing something thing that you receive today, like that, yeah, you know, all the ties and the socks uh, in the room, something like that. Um, we, we love getting gifts, and what we've done as a church is we began a few weeks ago looking at this idea of spiritual gifts, because Scripture teaches that the Lord has given followers of Jesus, given Christians gifts, giving them spiritual gifts. Uh, and there's been some curiosity in our church about like, okay, well, what is my spiritual gift? How do I know what it is? What is its purpose? And so we began a few weeks ago just like, hey, let's look at it. Let's see if we can understand this thing. Because just like the gift that goes under your Christmas tree at Christmas, it's not yours to use until you receive it, until you open it, until you do the thing that it was designed to do. And in many ways, I think Maybe out of ignorance that some Christians didn't know that they were getting a gift from the Lord. Um, they just haven't leaned into it. They haven't started using their gift. And so we've wanted to, for the last three weeks now, um, just get a good theology of what spiritual gifts are, how they're meant to be used in our own lives, in the lives of our church, um, and, and to unwrap that a little bit. And so I, I worked out last week this really long paragraph of a definition. I make no apologies for how nerdy this, this definition is, but it is a definition that, that I wrote as I was processing this. And I just want to go over it again for one final time. That What do we mean when we say spiritual gifts? How is a spiritual gift different than anything else that the Lord has given you? Is, there, uh, is a spiritual gift the same as a fruit of the Spirit? And the answer is no. Um, is a spiritual gift the same as just being a mature Christian and growing in your faith? And the answer is no. You can be a very immature Christian and very gifted as well. Um, they're not correlated in that way. What, what is a spiritual gift? Let's put this long paragraph up behind me, please. Um, a spiritual gift or gifts are unique callings and abilities placed on individual believers. There's not going to be a test on this later, so don't get overwhelmed by, by this. But uh, what, what are spiritual gifts? Well, the first thing we need to understand is that there are unique callings and abil abilities placed on individual believers. Your spiritual gift and your spouse's spiritual gift are not likely to be the same, okay? Um, in fact, it seems to be part of its purpose is that there is not uniformity, that spiritual gifts are uh, different amongst a church, amongst Believers, there are unique callings and abilities placed on individual believers who place them by God at his own discretion and for his own purposes. Every time spiritual gifts are mentioned in Scripture, you see that it is by the will of God that they were placed on someone. He chooses what he's doing. He has his purposes for it, and he gets to place what they are. Um, if you don't like your spiritual gift, you get to return to sender. 
No. Yeah, some of you are giggling because that's a really ridiculous thing to say, isn't it? Like, oh, I didn't want to have this spiritual gift of mercy. I feel, I feel so soft. I'm always crying about things. Well, you don't get to choose what your spiritual gift is. The Lord has chosen it for you, and he has placed it at his own discretion. For what purpose? To work in conjunction with gifts given to other individual members of the same church. Every time spiritual gifts are mentioned in Scripture, every time, we're going to look at two more times today, it is mentioned in the conversation of how the body is supposed to work. You as a church, if you belong to, you know, Carpenter's Way, whatever church you belong to, you belong to a body of believers. And those gifts, those spiritual gifts are given to you so that they work in conjunction with the spiritual gift of the person that's next to you, so that together we're working towards one goal um, to use our gifts in conjunction with one another. For, for, for what? For the common good and the building up of the entire gathered church. We owe ourselves to each other. And we use our spiritual gifts for the common good of every member of the church. And what is the church supposed to do? What's the mission of the church? And that is to accomplish the church's mission to bring glory to God through the message of the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's a long definition. No apologies given to you. It's just, it's just a lot of words. The point is this, is that if you're a follower of Jesus, you have a spiritual gift. And that spiritual gift is meant to be expressed in the context of the church that you belong to so that the church that you belong to can accomplish what it was called to do. Here's, here's, here's a reality we have to come face to face with, is that if you believe that God forms the church, if you believe that God is the, the king, the ruler over the church, and he has given each church a mission to accomplish, then you have to understand that spiritual gifts are given so that that mission can be accomplished. Failure to bring your spiritual gift to the table is going to stunt the church's ability to do what God is calling the church to do. And so in, in this conversation on spiritual gifts, uh, it forces you and I to come to two uncomfortable conclusions. They're uncomfortable because, you know, we're, we're Americans and we're individualistic as Americans. As Americans, we have individual rights and we stand for our rights. And so we have to come to this, these two conclusions is that we owe ourselves to one another. Not only do we have individual rights, but we have individual responsibilities to bring our full self to the table, and we owe ourselves to one another. And the second is this, that none of us are fully equipped to accomplish everything we're called to accomplish as a church. You don't have all of the gifts yourself, but if you belong to your church and you grow inside the body of your church, then the gifts are expressed so that we can all accomplish this together. Okay. That's, that's, that's that. Let's, let's open our scriptures. Uh, we're going to be in two different passages today. We're going to start in 1 Peter, uh, which is towards the end of your New Testament. Um, and then we'll back up and go to Ephesians. Uh, so 1 Peter chapter 4 and then Ephesians chapter 4 is where we'll go next. I'll give you a second to get there. When we began this uh, study, I told you that spiritual gifts appear in four passages. There are five lists in four different passages of the Bible. We've looked at two of them already. The first week, we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 because it is this long chapter, long explanation of spiritual gifts, and so that's where we started. Last week, we were in Romans chapter 12 because that's another list of the gifts, um, and you're gonna find every time you look at a list of the gifts that there's different gifts given because no one list is meant to be this exhaustive thing that, that tells you everything you're supposed to know. There, there are to be examples of spiritual gifts. The last two passages that we're going to look at today, 1 Peter chapter 4, which is going to be the shortest of them, and then Ephesians chapter 4 uh, is where we'll close today. Let's, let's look at it together and see how far we can get. If we have time, what I'll do is I'll go over a few of the spiritual gifts at the end of our time uh, and maybe challenge yourself to start asking, oh, does that sound like me? Does that look like what I might have? Um, we'll, see, we'll see how far we get. 1 Peter chapter 4, starting in verse 7 says, uh, the end of all things is at hand. You got to love whenever a passage is going to begin. It's like, hey, we're getting close to the end of everything, okay? Just the end of the world. Here we go. Um, when, when I think of modern Christians talking about the end of all things, maybe, maybe you have a different view than me. I get this image in my head of someone who's a little on the conspiracy side of the spectrum, uh, someone who gets a little angry and starts yelling a lot. Uh, maybe they're like, they're wagging their finger and they're a little bit more fear-mongering. Does that sound 
like what you think of? You, you, you're like fear mongering? Let's see how Peter does this. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self controlled and sober minded for the sake of your prayers. Peter's like, hey, I think we're getting close to the end of the world. Let's all just take a breath, okay? Let's be calm. Let's not, let's not lose our minds. Let's be sober minded for the sake of your prayers, he says. Verse 8, he says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. You know, as Peter is assuming that we're getting close to the end of time, the end of the ages, he's like, look, just keep loving each other. Um, this is backwards to what like modern, you know, uh, angry sounding people do whenever they're thinking the end of the world is at hand. You watch the news, the whole world's coming down, sky is falling, let's burn it down, let's freak out, ah, everybody's screaming. And he's taking the opposite direction. He's like, look, just like be more sober minded, love one another earnestly, he says, since love covers a multitude of sins. I love this. Um, because we haven't got to the spiritual gifts yet, but love one another earnestly. Why? Because love covers a multitude of sins. What he does not say is, hey, you know, I know you think it was a sin, but it really wasn't. They didn't really hurt you in that way. He doesn't say ignore the sin. He doesn't say that you're not going to hurt each other. Um, I, tell, tell me if this resonates with you. Uh, you hear people, they say, hey, I used to go to church, but they said this, or they treated me this way. I'm not going to go to church anymore because of these things. Uh, they sinned against me. Does that sound, that sound right? You hear people talk like that? Yeah? No? Some of you are like, I, I'm scared. I don't want to get kicked out of here. You're not going to get kicked out, okay? Like, we love you. Uh, it says that love covers a multitude of sins, um, one of the realities that we're going to have to come face to face with if we're going to talk about the body, if we're going to talk about the church, is that we're still broken people. We are sinners saved by grace, but we were sinners first. And there's going to come times where we just offend each other, where we, where we injure each other, either on purpose or by accident. And, and the right thing to do, if that's you, is to apologize for that. But, but like, what, what do we do? Like, how do we respond to it? Well, he says that love covers a multitude of sins. Continue to love one another. Seek out how to do that earnestly. How do you do that? Verse 9, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. I, I love that Peter is the one who adds this, because Peter has a little bit of an anger streak. I don't know if you know Peter from this, you know, the Gospels. Uh, he cut some dude's ear off at one point. So when he says without grumbling, he knows a thing or two about grumbling. Uh, he says, continue to show hospitality <clears throat> with, without, without grumbling. You guys know people who are nice to you, but it's through like gritting their teeth. They're, just, they're so angry at you. But they're nice about it. Uh, he's like, don't, don't be like that. Show hospitality to each other without grumbling. And now we get to the gifts. Verse 10. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. What is, there, what is the purpose of our gift? To serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. That word steward is this idea of being a manager. Uh, anybody in here ever been a manager of like Radio Shack or... Pizza Hut, I know it's like, it's, was it the 1800s? Like Radio Shack is still around. Um, here's the thing, like if you're hired to work at a place and your boss is like, hey, you're doing really great. Really love what you're doing. We're gonna promote you to manager. Does that now make you the owner of all the things in the store? No, it's not. In fact, if you act like it does make you the owner, that's called theft, okay? And you will be, you'll be arrested and you will lose your job if you start treating everything in that building like you own it. If you're the manager, you're not the owner of the thing, you're the steward of the thing. The price that the, the boss has set is the price that you're supposed to exact from people and you're supposed to maintain good customer service on behalf of your establishment. You are representing the owners. You're representing the real, you know, the, the property owner, the, the, the one who actually owns all of these things. And what, what Peter is saying whenever he says that we have these gifts to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace, he's saying that you have been given something that you are called to manage on behalf of the creator of the universe. He's given you a gift. He's given you a purpose. He's given you a role that your job is to steward it, is to manage it, is to use it for his glory, for his purposes. What are some of the gifts? Verse 11, we get one of them. Whoever speaks. 
the way Peter talks about this is that he's going to talk about two gifts. His, his list of spiritual gifts is two, so that's just not a lot. It's the shortest of all the lists. And he says, whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God. If the Lord has given you a mouthpiece, a, a, a platform that you're called to teach people about God, then you should speak as if what you're saying is an actual oracle of God, that he has, he has entrusted you with this message. You should, you should seek to understand that message. If you're going to be a teacher, you need to know what this message is, this, this message of God's goodness, his glory, his, his rescue plan. But you speak as a one who speaks the oracles of God. What's his second gift? Whoever serves. His, his gift is, well, some people are gifted to speak and some people are gifted to serve. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. It's a weird qualification. You serve as someone who is given strength by God to do that thing. There's a, a problem. I think this is human nature. I don't think this is just the church. But the things that we're gifted at, the things that we become good at, sometimes we have this tendency to become prideful in or to become arrogant in. I uh, will never be prideful as a musician. There's some very obvious reasons for that because I can't do any of the things that these people do up here. I play a radio out of tune. I, I have no skills at all. But I could see in myself this, this tendency that if I became good at singing or if I became good at playing the that I get to a place where I'm just like, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at this. You guys should really respect my, my skills at that thing. And the way that Peter talks about serving is that you, you serve by the strength that God supplies. You keep yourself in a, a place of humility, realizing that the Lord has given you the strength, the skills to do that thing, to get to that, to that place. You, you, you kind of keep yourself in a place of humility. In order that, he says, in order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. What is the purpose of these gifts? Well, in everything that we do, God's going to be glorified through Jesus. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I plan to live a long time um, by, by our standards. You know, I, I, I tell, some, some people ask me, like, hey, Jesse, you know, like, uh, how long are you going to be a pastor? Well, my, my plan is this is my last job. Uh, I, I plan to die as pastor. I don't plan for that to be anytime soon either. I'm going to be like 85, 95, 105 years old when it happens. But a day will come. Where, where I move along. This, this is not, this is not, uh, it's not my job to glorify myself. It is not your job to glorify yourself. Whatever your role is in your family, whatever your role is in your, in your job, it will be carried on by the next generation of people. And to understand spiritual gifts is to keep that in check, that in all things, God gets glory. We step out of the way so that he can get glory. So 1 Peter, this, this passage that we just read, is the shortest of the lists on, list on spiritual gifts. He just has two. You speak as if speaking the oracles of God, and you serve as if God's the one who gave you the strength. Let's look at one more passage. This will close out our series is in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians is uh, kind of towards the middle of your, your New Testament. A way to remember that is uh, uh, General Electric, so Galatians, Ephesians. There's a whole thing. I forgot the whole acronym. General Electric Company of America. No, that's not right. <laughs> something, something like that. Uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 4. Uh, let's begin. It says, I, therefore... A prisoner for the Lord. Uh, Paul uh, is the author of Ephesians. This is not a euphemism. He's actually in prison. He's not like, I'm trapped by Jesus. It's, uh, no, he's actually in prison for following Jesus uh, as he's writing this letter. He says, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Very similar to what Peter was saying. That we, we serve, we're stewards of this thing that we're given. Paul is saying, look, you have a life. I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the life that the Lord has given you. Has the Lord given you life? Has the Lord given you reason to celebrate? Um, if, if you have any, anything that you're thankful for, walk in a manner worthy of that thing that you've been called. How should that look? What, what should it look like? Verse 2, with all humility and gentleness, 
with patience, bearing with one another in love. How should we interact with each other? Well, we should be humble with each other. We should be gentle with each other. We should be patient with each other. We should be bearing with one another in love. Um, is bearing one another in love, is that kind of, is that in the absence of conflict? Or is that going to be in some kind of conflict? It's, it's, it's in. Yeah, it's okay. You know, like, I'm not asking true questions. It, it, it is. Like, like, Peter just said, hey, you know, um, honor each other. Like, uh, love covers a multitude of sins. There's going to be conflict. So love one another. Paul is saying a similar thing. Bear with one another in love. Eager, he says in verse 3, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What we should be fighting for is unity in our body. Why is it that every time I'm about to talk about spiritual gifts, I'm going to talk about the church? I'm going to talk about the body. Because every list of spiritual gifts in Scripture, every time, mentions the body, how it interacts with each other, and how we are, used, or how we are supposed to use these gifts to love one another, to build each other up. It says, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, there is one body and one spirit. Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. He, he's saying, look, make no mistake about it. There's not multiple Jesuses in the world. There's not multiple creators. It's not like this church worships one God and that church down the road worships another God. That if, if you are a Christian anywhere in this world gathered on a Sunday, you're worshiping the same God empowered by the same spirit, serving the same Jesus. That's why we say time and time again at this church that we're not in competition with another church because we're a church. We're not a street gang, okay? We're not flashing like our, 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 our call signs or whatever. I, that's not called call signs. I, I'm, I'm betraying my lack of street knowledge all of a sudden. Um, we, we are very much not threatened by the success of any church in our community. In, in fact, quite the opposite. I've said, I said this last week that uh, I get together with a group of pastors that prays. They, they prayed this past week in this room. Listen to me. A church, a pastor of a church less than a mile from here prayed for you individually in a room full of about 15 pastors here on Thursday. It's a beautiful thing whenever men of God get together without any um, ego, without any agenda other than one thing, we fight for unity and we wanna proclaim the name of Jesus in our community. This is, this is what's happening in Mid-County. Why? Because there's only one God. There's only one Jesus. He's, he's the only hope of, of any of this. So Paul continues, he says in verse seven, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. He's gonna, he's gonna talk about these spiritual gifts and he says it's, they've been given to us according to whatever he wanted to accomplish. Therefore, it says in verse eight, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. I had to look up what this was. I, didn't, I don't recognize this passage just from reading it, so I Googled it. Uh, he's quoting Psalm 68 right here. If you have your own Bible, you may wanna make a note like, hey, that's Psalm 68. Um, this, this passage, uh, Psalm 68, is, uh, a, it's a song, because all the Psalms are songs. It's a song about humanity, all the people that are poor and in bondage, all the people who are oppressed by wicked people, are, as if they're being held in prison. And that this Messiah figure, this rescue figure that God is going to send, comes and he, he breaks everybody out of prison and then he gives them gifts and he gives them land and he gives them rule over creation so that those who were in power, those who were wicked, are put in their place. So it's like, it's, this is like some man, you know, music, right? This, this would be like, a, like a, a fight and a war scene. And Paul uses this to quote uh, as he talks about spiritual gifts. And then he gives a little explanation starting in verse 9. It says, in saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Paul is, he's, he's showing his Jewish roots right here. He's like, hey, if I'm going to quote the Old Testament, I need to tell you what happened. That, that the Lord Jesus descended from heaven to earth to rescue those of us who were in bondage to sin. And now that he's rescued us, he's given us gifts. What are those gifts? Verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. So he gives five 
uh, gifts here, five offices, if you will. Uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. For what purpose? Verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Why did, why did God give these gifts to the church? He gave it so that we could build up the saints for the work of ministry. What's weird about these, these roles, what's weird when we talk about spiritual gifts is that... I, I, I'll speak for myself. Most often, I think about it as if there are a few key people in the church that are called to do ministry, um, and then the rest of us, we get, to, we get to attend. We get to sing our songs. We get to meet and pray with other people. Then we go about our day. That's not how Paul thinks about this. This is not how any of the spiritual gifts seems to work. What, what the purpose is is so that we equip each other for the work of ministry, you should, as a result of being in a gathered group of people, be more equipped after you leave to continue doing the work of ministry than you were before you came into that body. It's, it's, what, it's what the church should do. You should, you should be able to leave here and have a sense of, like, how are you serving in the name of Jesus whenever you go to work tomorrow? How, how, are you, how are you representing and being a good steward of the gifts that he's given you whenever you're having to have that hard conversation with your boss on Thursday about that report? Uh, how, how should you, uh, I was going to say something about teacher, but y'all on summer break, so y'all, y'all can wait, okay? <laughs> September, you can, you can get back to using your gifts. No, no, like you, you meet with your teachers and you have, you have your, your trainings and your things. Every one of you has this life that is outside of this one hour of the week on a Sunday. This one hour is not your ministry. This isn't it. This is the training ground. This is where you rally together. This is where you start to consider, like, okay, what does the Lord have for me? This is where you ask somebody else to pray for you because you're running out of steam, and, and you don't know how you're going to get through the next week. And then, after you have been equipped for an hour, then you go and do your ministry, whatever it is that you're called to do. Verse 12, the purpose of these gifts is to equip you and I for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Until, verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Any of you really tired of this? Every time you turn around, like someone has a new narrative. Every, every time you turn on the news, it's like a new thing you're supposed to be scared of. Anybody tired of the emotional back and forth and the tug of war of just, it's always a new problem. It's always a new thing. Everybody has a new, like, this is the way that they're lying to you today. And they've always known this. And it just, it just, it seems to never end, does it? It seems like if, if you wake up every day and you just write down what's the new lie, it's going to be just this endless journal of a new lie that you're being told, like, hey, this is what they've been lying to you about. And Paul is saying, you know what? By practicing your spiritual gifts, by growing in your spiritual gifts, you become insulated to being tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning. Like, like your life stabilizes because you become more mature. You become a little bit more firm-footed in who the Lord has created you to be. That in no matter whatever the world is going to do, no matter what the news is going to do whenever you turn it on in a moment, um, you know that God's in control, and he's, he's got this. He says, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. From him, uh, excuse me, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. What we should do and what we should expect to happen is that we become more mature and that the people around us also become more mature. And then we're better able to weather the storms as they come and lift each other up and to equip each other for, for goodness, to point each other to, to Jesus. So over the last three weeks, we've looked at every passage on spiritual gifts. You've read them all now. If you've been here for three weeks in a row, you've read every passage there is in the Bible about spiritual gifts. If, if I could, uh, I want to take the next five minutes, 
And I just want to look at a few spiritual gifts, explain them a little bit. Uh, maybe you want to, to look them up yourself. Um, I'll tell you what, if you, if you have a pen, uh, I'll tell you, like, uh, there, there's some tests that you can take uh, on spiritual gifts. I plan to write one. I, I don't like any of them, if I had to be honest with you. I don't think any of them are actually like, this is the one. Uh, but it may be helpful for you to have a conversation with someone, okay? And so if you wanted to, you could go to giftstest.com, plural gifts, G I F T S. T-E-S-T dot com. Uh, and it's a spiritual gifts test. Um, it'll ask you, I don't know, 20 questions, 50 questions, something like that. And at the end, it'll give you some idea of what spiritual gift or gifts you might have, okay? Um, I, I would just say this. Take it as a grain of salt, as part of your conversation with the Lord. Is that my gift, Lord? Is that what you've called me to do? How can I use this to glorify you? You may completely disagree with the test because I don't think any of them are 100% accurate. Um, Whenever I go through uh, the, the four passages with five lists total of spiritual gifts, when I write them out, I get somewhere in the ballpark of 20 gifts. I say in the ballpark because like, I don't know that there's really a difference between the gift of leadership and the gift of administration as they're described in scripture, except they're in two different lists. I think that maybe he just switched words. So, like, they could very well be the same thing. So it's hard to come out with an exact number of gifts. But uh, if I could, I just want to look at a few of them in Scripture, give you a definition of what they are and where to find them. Uh, I'm going to try. I think I have the same order. Is the first one prophecy, Barbara? There we go. Okay, so uh, we won't look at all of them for the sake of time, but we'll look at a few. Uh, the gift of prophecy is listed in four different lists of Scripture. So Ephesians 4, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and the two spots that are listed there. Uh, a good working definition of the gift of prophecy is going to be a special ability to tell something that God spontaneously brought to mind. Uh, Grudem is uh, Wayne Grudem. That's his definition. So uh, it's just me quoting him. I, I said last week that C.H. Spurgeon, if you know him, the British uh, pastor, he claimed to have the spiritual gift of prophecy. And at least uh, 12 times in his ministry, which covers the course of I don't know how many decades he preached, uh, he, he can think of moments where he just spontaneously knew someone needed to repent of something and he called them out on it and they were just completely uh, uh, speechless about it. Um, something that I think is important to note about, quote, the spiritual gift of prophecy is that this has far less to do with like telling the future. Uh, who here, when you think of prophet, you think of like, someone who knows the future, someone who knows how it's all going to end. That's, that's usually the picture we have in mind, but that's not the biblical definition of prophet. It has less to do with foretelling and more to do with what's called forthtelling. To be able to just speak plainly, this is what you're doing wrong. I, I think that the Lord is calling you out on this thing. You need to treat them better. And so it's it, it, a better way to understand it is someone who can speak fearlessly in a, in a, in a, in a setting, um, uh, uh, the mind of God, usually calling someone to repentance. I'll give one caution about this gift of prophecy because it depends on where you see it in action. Um, this does not carry and should never carry the same weight as, as Scripture. If someone's like, hey, I, I'm a prophet, the Lord has given me the, the gift to tell you this, and then they say something that's like, hey, I know Ephesians 4 said this, but actually he means this now, that guy's a liar, okay? Just tell him, like, no, you don't get to contradict Scripture because God never contradicts himself, okay? That's not how the gift of prophecy should be understood. Um, the second is called the gift of service. Uh, I, I like this one because I think we have a lot of people here that would have what I would call the, the gift of service or from the list in Romans, uh, what I would call like a pay it forward kind of service. You can find this in First Peter, you can find this in Romans, um, and it may be related to what is listed as the gift of helps in First Corinthians chapter 12. Um, a good definition of this is gonna be a special ability to identify unmet needs within the body and to begin addressing them with the resources at hand. Someone with the gift of service, what you see them do a lot is without asking questions, they jump in to help. They're the first ones to show up, usually the last ones to leave. They're wanting to be practically helpful. 
if, if you have a, a plumbing need, they're probably not going to be the ones that give you the phone number to the plumber. They're probably going to be the ones who show up with a, a plumber's wrench and some, you know, some solder or something at your house. They're the ones who are ready to jump in and get their hands dirty. They very much enjoy being outside the spotlight, and they want to see uh, you help. They want to see you, uh, you get what you need. The gift of teaching. gift of teaching is a special ability to explain scripture and apply it to people's lives. These are the kinds of people uh, that have the gift of teaching that they can take they can take passages and they can explain it to you in a way that gives you that aha moment. Like as they're talking about it, like I've heard that a thousand times and all of a sudden it just like it comes to you. I think some people, I, I, I didn't talk to these people to ask them, but some people that come to mind whenever I think of like who do I know that has the gift of teaching? I think of Matt Chandler, I think of Tim Mackey, I think of a guy named Marty Solomon, I don't know if you know him, a guy named Matt Whitman, uh, Tim Keller, C.S. Lewis, R.C. Sproul. These are people that I, I enjoy listening because they will explain things to me uh, in ways that just give me those aha moments. These are people that are insatiably curious about God's word, and they're always looking for the next thing, um, and they love n- nothing more than to just explain to you, like, hey, I learned this new, might be a Greek thing, might be a systematic theology thing. They just keep teaching, uh, and they, they can't stop. Gift of encouragement. I know several people in this room today, right now, that have the gift of encouragement. And most people with the gift of encouragement don't even know that it's a spiritual gift. It's a spiritual gift to encourage someone. The word that is usually used in these lists is the gift of exhortation. Uh, Romans 12 is where you find this in the list. I, I call this like contagious encouragement because it's like after you've been encouraged by someone, the gift of encouragement, you're like, you're ready to pass it on. You're ready like, oh, I feel good. I want you to feel good too. You're doing great too. Thank you so much. Uh, a definition of this is a special ability to come alongside another person with words of encouragement, support, inspiration. These are the people that they send you a text For them, it was just like you popped in their mind. For you, it was like at the exact right moment, they gave you a kind word, a sense of encouragement, like you're ready to keep going. You you caught your breath again, and you can put one foot in front of another. Oh, we could, there's there's 20 of these things. I'm going to run out of time. Uh, The gift of giving. I'll speed up a little bit. The gift of giving uh, or contributing or generous giving, if you will, is a special ability to give resources, usually money, towards God's mission with intense joy and without much consideration for scarcity. These people with the gift of giving are not necessarily rich, um, but they definitely find great joy in unloading money on anything that they see the Lord doing. Um, these are the ones who, like when uh, just a few weeks ago, as we were announcing fundraisers for camp, these are people who were like, hey, listen, I'm ready to, I'll pay for an entire kid to go to camp. I had somebody call me and said, my boss wants to pay off every other, every kid that wants to go to camp. Like, how much money do you owe to get all the kids to camp? I was like, ah, and I looked it up. And I was like, it's, it's about $1,500. Like, okay, I can, we can do half of that. I was like, what? Like, half, pay for half of the kids to go to camp? And they did. Um, they, they, just, they just love giving uh, towards things that they see God doing. They find this great satisfaction that the money that they've earned is used for God's glory, for his mission. Uh, the gift of leading uh, is, is listed in scripture. This is enthusiastic leading. This isn't just a boss. This is someone who people follow them and they love following them. They love that this person has a vision for the future. It's a special ability to lead other people towards their own understanding of God's mission. Uh, I, could, I could keep going. I'm, I'm gonna stop for time. The gift of uh, mercy are people who jump in uh, and they show kindness. They, they're the ones to, who forgive. Someone who says, hey, I messed up, the person with the gift of mercy is the first one to come alongside them. It's like, I'm ready to help you rebuild. I'm, I'm wanting to see you uh, get that done. The gift of discernment, the gift of evangelists. Um, if you guys want a list, ask me for it. I'll, I'll mail you, email you this, this whole thing. Um, gift of tongues is listed in scripture. I wanted to take a moment to speak on that. Um, I don't know if I have time to give it justice, though. The gift of tongues is mentioned in 1 Corinthians, uh, in in the list in 1 Corinthians. 
Um, but then it's mentioned elsewhere in Scripture, usually in the book of Acts. Uh, a good working definition is a special ability to speak another language for the declaration of the gospel. When it first appears in scriptures in Acts 2, um, and it's the ability to speak a language that the people don't know. Uh, that So the person speaking doesn't know how to speak, I don't know, uh, um, Ethiopian. But the man from Ethiopia hears the gospel preached in his own language. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and chapter 14, he gives a great amount of instruction about the gift of tongues. Um, and in 1 Corinthians 14, you find that it's also used as a private prayer language. It comes up there as well. Um, and there are instructions for how to use it in order, that in a, a corporate worship, uh, it needs an interpreter. So the gift of tongues and the gift of interpretation go together. It is not in Scripture ever listed as a sign of spiritual maturity or as a sign of salvation. Um, and any church that teaches or elevates the gift of tongues to that level is, is out of accordance with Scripture. Um, that being said, if you have questions about spiritual gifts, uh, come, come let me know. Uh, what I want to say as we close out is that if you are a follower of Jesus, you have been given at least one or more spiritual gifts. I would encourage you as part of your worship, as part of your growth, to find out what your gift is and start to use it. Okay? Find your gift and use it. You will find great joy and satisfaction from doing that. And you'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now and we give you all the praise that you are a God who you, you, you intricately knit the body together in ways that, uh, you know, it's a mystery to us. And so, um, Lord, we thank you for spiritual gifts. We thank you that each person in here that is a follower of Jesus has a gift that you've given them. I pray, Lord, that you would reveal it to us, that you would so, show us how to serve you. Um, and on, on that breath, Lord, we thank you for Jason and his family. We thank you for the gifts that you have given him to, uh, to show your glory in all the different ways that it has happened. So we just pray that you continue to bless him and his family as they uh, continue to serve you. And uh, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name.